Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parsha. Today is Wednesday, June 2nd. And we are coming at you live and online from Atlanta, Georgia for Daily Power Parsha. Good. This week's Torah portion is Shlach, as you know. And the main dominant story that we began the Parsha with was the story of the spies or the scouts who thought themselves as spies who wanted to star in their own film, apparently, and become very important. And thus, they, um, they, uh, they, what not, or, and they gave a negative report about the land of Israel, and the people panicked, and God said, all right, this was what we learned yesterday. God says, you don't want to go in? You don't want to go into Israel? You think it's too dangerous, too scary, too, too, too uh, impossible to do? No problem. I'm not going to force you. Don't no, no one's going to force you into doing anything you don't want. It's free choice. You don't want to go in. That's fine. You can stay right here. You can stay in the midbar. You can stay in the desert. Totally fine. Well, oh, and, and God told Moses, by the way, don't even try to go in at this point because Amalek is there and the Canaanites are there and I'm not with you anywhere at this point going up into battle. So don't be trying on your own to go into Israel because, yeah, then you are going to face giants and angry other nations without my protection, and that's not going to be a good formula for success. That's how we ended off yesterday's reading. So we pick it up today. Um, literally, that's how we left it off. And I, I specifically kept the third reading open here, right? The Amalekites and Canaanites dwell in the valley God says, in other words, don't try this at home. Tomorrow, turn back and journey into the desert toward the Red Sea. God says, all right, you're going to stay in the desert. Turn back. Cancel the approach to Israel. Let's continue inside. Uh, fourth reading. Numbers chapter 4. Sorry, 14, verse 26. God continues the dialogue. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, again, all fallout from the spies. How much longer will this evil congregation who are causing, the, uh, causing to complain against me exist? Wow, that's a bit of a convoluted sense. How much longer will this evil congregation exist? Who is this evil congregation? They who are causing to complain against me. By the way, who is this evil congregation? It's a reference to the 10 spies that went rogue. There were two, there were 12 total, two stayed kosher, 10 went rogue. And Rashi says, this refers to the spies, the congregation of the spies. We derive from here that a, that a minion, a congregation, numbers a minimum of 10. We learn that 10 is a minion from the spies. You can't make this up. The fact that, that God says to Moshe and Aaron, the Moses and Aaron, the fact that God says, this evil congregation has caused the people to turn against me, referencing the 10 rogue spies, calling them an evil congregation, teaches us what a minion is, what a congregation is. At the minimum, it's a minimum of 10. And I'm sure I pointed this out last year because, like, you can't not point this out. It's like, what? The source of a minion, the source of a congregation, which is like a holy entity in Judaism, comes from the congregation of the spies. These, this, this evil, well, evil, whatever, it's harsh, but I guess God says evil, but this not so nice group of people that, you know, turn the people against God. That, and I know I explained yesterday, according to Kabbalah and Chassidus, like the deeper positive intention. Okay, either way, it was the wrong thing. But we're learning a minion from a wrong group of people, the 10 spies that went you know, south. That's where we learn it from. Yeah. And what's the message? Even the 10 spies, they also make a minion. <laughs> In other words, yeah, it's not good what they did, but they count for a minion. They count for a minion, which tells us that, that when it comes to a minion, we don't look at, at piety, character, righteousness. 
we look at Jewishness, right? It's, um, it's about inclusivity. And I know, I know the elephant in the room, maybe not the elephant is that traditionally women are not counted for the minion, but we've explained, it's not that women aren't counted or it's not that women don't count for any minion, a prayer minion specifically, right? When it comes to a minion, a quorum, a congregation for other purposes, like the sanctification of Hashem's name, yes, women are part of that congregation, counted part of that congregation. When it comes to prayer, you count for the minion, toward the minion, people that are obligated, specifically in communal prayer, and women are exempt from that. Not that they can't, not that they shouldn't, but they're they're not obligated to. And thus, if they're not obligated, they don't they don't count toward the ten obligatory members of the congregation. Anyway, a bit of a technicality, but I wanted to make sure to mention it. But the overall point here is that when it comes to a minion, we don't discriminate based on piety. Say, oh, wait a second, you did something not right. Mm, you're not allowed to pray with us. That's not how it works. Everyone is welcome in the minion. In fact, the, the source of it is the spies. Yes, Ray. Okay. So, so I, I was asked to be a tense person in the minion where someone had to say Kaddish, where I teach, which is not Orthodox. I said, no. I said, if I were a male, I'd be happy to do it, but I can't do it. And they were not very happy with me. They did not get a minion that morning. So... I still felt like I did the right thing by not doing it. Listen, again, I, I, I'm if from a traditional, when I say traditional, what I mean is like before Orthodox became a, became a label, before conservative or reform or whatever it is, before labels became labels, there was just Judaism. And when it was just Judaism, traditionally, right, tradition, fiddler on the roof this Sunday, right, when it was tradition, traditionally, Jewishly, you counted those, you need 10 for a minion, you need 10 obligatory communal prayer participants, which would include males over 13, Jewish males over 13. So yes, correct. Now, is it how, see, I think the, the challenge is how do you explain context on one foot when you have an issue that's so that brings up so many associated, you know, feelings because it's part of a larger picture, right? It's like, how are women? It's, a, it's part of a much bigger issue. But in all honesty, if we're really looking at it, it's kind of like we're just dragging in, you know, minion into it. Again, I'm not I'm not criticizing i'm not what i'm just explaining what's going on here so minion is getting pulled into something when maybe i would argue it's not necessarily the same paradigm it's not the same it's not it's not what's going on that's not that's not part of the you know um oppression or whatever it is that this is a a, a completely different situation but it's pulled in and then now you're dealing with a situation where somebody a needs a minion and b feels strongly that women should be included in general and in minion as well. And now it's like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And then you look, be, yeah, and then you're looked at as, you know, like what's wrong with right. you. And again, it's, it, I don't know that there's a way to explain this, you know, on one foot. I can't even explain this right now in, in the time that we have without doing a real, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like I'm doing um, uh, a, a sufficient job in in, a, in in covering this issue. It's I'm I'm not, and I know I'm not. But let alone you being asked, you know, quickly, hey, be part of this. And like I'm sorry, I, it's just not the way I, I I do things. I I don't have an answer for you, and I don't I don't have advice to what to do next time if there is a next time. I don't know. It, it's it's a it's a complex it's a tricky thing, be, specifically because. It's a, it's more of an emotional issue because you're because you can explain I could explain it like well you know based on Jewish law this is how it works and it's like so what does that mean that you don't value I mean and then it, it just becomes right it, it goes to a different place and I hear it I'm, I don't not hear it I get it if I were writing the rules that might be something else but this is traditionally the way halacha works and yeah. 
This is the way it works. This is the way we operate a Chabad and in other traditional circles. Um, not, it's not a criticism of anything. It's not whatever. It's, yeah, everyone's got their, their way of doing things. But this is at least the framework for that. Anyway, I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I answered anything, but at least these are some thoughts that are that I'm thinking about in this context. But anyway, I think it's interesting that that minion, the source of minion in general, is coming from the evil congregation of the spies, which I think is telling that a minion is open to all. Next, um, so Hashem is telling Moshe and Aaron how much longer are they going to is this going to happen? The complaints of the children of Israel, which they caused them to complain against me, I have heard. In other words, loud and clear, the people don't want to go to Israel. They want to go back to Egypt. They want a new God or a new leader. I hear them loud and clear. So, says God, say to them, tell the people, as I live, says the Lord, if not as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. In other words, I will do as you requested. You requ I'm hearing you request not to go into the land. No problem. You won't. In this desert, says God, your corpses shall fall. You're in and, and by the way, this is not just God telling Moses and Aaron. This is him telling them to tell the people this. In this desert, your corpses shall fall. Your entire number. Well, all those from age of 20 and up, 20 to 60, who were counted, the males, because you complained against me, your corpses shall fall. That's just the explanation of who, who's a part of this decree. And here we have the divine decree in the aftermath of the sin of the spies that that generation will die out in the desert and not come to the land. You, this generation, shall not come into the land concerning which I raise my hand promising that you would settle in it, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So of this entire congregation of men, 20 to 60, that participated in the fetching and the complaining and the crying, oh, we don't want to go in, no problem, you won't, you'll die out over the next 40 years. Oh, we haven't said 40 years yet, but you'll die out over the next duration of time. And not go into Israel except for two people, Caleb and Joshua, which were, as you know, the two kosher spies. And as for your infants, remember the babies of whom you said that they will be as spoils? Remember when the people were crying? They said, oh, no, if we go into the land, our women and our babies will be taken as spoils of war. God says, remember those infants, those helpless infants that would be taken by the enemy? Yeah. Um, I will bring them there. They're going to be the ones going into Israel. They're going to, you weren't up to the challenge. The infants that you're concerned about, they're going to grow up over the next 40 years. And they're going to be the ones courageous enough to go in. They will be the ones, I will bring them there. Sometimes we underestimate the kids, right? What do they know? They're just kids. We have to shelter them, protect them. God's like, the kids, they got this. You don't have this. They have this. They'll be, they'll be strong enough to do this. And they will come to know the land which you despised. Your children will come to know the land. But as for you, once again, in case you didn't realize what I was saying before, in case it didn't register, God says, your corpses shall fall in this desert. Your children shall wander the desert for 40 years. <laughs> And bear, hey Mark, and bear your defection. In other words, they're going to carry the weight of your defection, defection, until the last of your corpses has fallen in the desert. So there's wandering, desert wandering for 40 years. Why 40 years, by the way? Let's continue. According to the number of days which you tore the land, 40 days. So it's going to be a day for each year. You will thus bear your iniquities for 40 years. Thus, you will come to know my alienation. <laughs> Again, trust me, I'm reading this loud and clear. I, what you're getting, I'm getting. The simple understanding of the story is the people rebelled. God was angry and punished them like that. I told you yesterday, deeper ideas, mystical ideas, philosophical ideas. They weren't ready. God says, no worries. Um, spiritually, they wanted to stay in a spiritual cocoon. God says, okay, again, 
wish is granted, next generation will go in. There's more of an angry energy when you read or, or whatever, when you read it inside. But we know anyway, God doesn't get angry. Even if it says God got angry, as I mentioned many, many times, right? It's all anthropomorphic kind of um, association. It's not real. It's not real emotions. Um, nonetheless, this is what came down. What came down is, bottom line is, 40 years of wandering, right? Why 40? According to the number of days which they toured the land, which was 40 days. So they went and walked around the, the land of Israel for 40 days and then brought back the report. God says, okay, 40 days of touring, 40 years of wandering. Why a day a year? I don't know, but at least it kind of sounds like it matches on some level. I mean, somebody could argue and say, well, 40 days should be 40 days, but I guess that's not long enough for a timeout and for this situation. Okay, and also, honestly, the generation just has to pass the torch to the next one. I, the Lord, have spoken. If I will not do this to this entire to the entire evil congregation who assembled against me, and I, it, these are poetic ways of speaking that don't the senses don't end, right? If I will not do this, what, what are you saying? You are, or you aren't going to do this. Basically, God is saying, I promise that I will be doing this. Like, you'll see if I won't do this. In other words, I'm going to do this. I, the Lord, have spoken. If I will not do this, I'm going to do this the entire real congregation. In this desert, they will end, and there they will die. That whole generation died out, 20 to 60, over the next 40 years. Oh, ho, 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 ho. As for the men who Moses had sent to scout the land, the 10 spies, the evil congregation, who returned and caused the entire congregation to complain against him by spreading a slanderous report about the land. The men who spread an evil report about the land died in the plague before the Lord. Not over 40 years, but instantly. Are you with me on this? So God says, the people that panicked, all right, they're not going to go in. But the peep, the spies, the 10 spies who turned everyone against Moses and God, they will die instantly in a plague. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, they remained alive of the men who went to tour the land. So again, same deal. Those 10 perished in a plague. Everyone else slated to die over the next 40 years. Joshua and Caleb are okay. Now, all of that is what God tells Moses to tell the people. Moses then related all these words to the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. They were in shambles, heartbroken. They were devastated. What were they devastated? That's it. They're not going to go into the promised land. This is, this is it. What you see, this desert landscape, that's it. That's it. That's all you got. At some point over the next 40 years, you're going to die out here in this desert. It, it, it rocked the people. It hit them so deeply. They were just in mourning. Yeah. You know what's going on here? They're crying again. Yesterday they cried because they were going into the land. They thought they were had to go into the land and they didn't want to. Now they're crying because they're not going to be able to go into the land. Yeah, that's such as the way of human beings, right? They panic, and then you tell them, okay, you won't, you can't. Then like, well, I want to. We talked about this in the JLI class last week. It's kind of like the negative pressure, right? There's positive inducement, and then there's negative inducement. You can either tempt someone into activity by giving them a reward or evoke their chutzpah, if you will, or their um, I'll show you by telling them they can't. Oh yeah? Well, now I want to. So Moses tells the people, all right, this is what God said, you ain't going into Israel. Oh no, we want to go in. Suddenly you want to go in? Why are they mourning greatly? Because they want to go in now. But yes, sir, you don't want to go in. There's no, there's no answer to that. It's just human psychology. It's the way it is. Then guess, guess what happens next? Yep, they try anyway. At least some try anyway. They arose early in the morning, some did, and they ascended to the mountaintop saying, 
We are ready to go up to the place of which the Lord spoke, for we have sinned. We have seen the light. We have recognized the error of our ways. And now we're ready to go to Israel. Yeah, a day late, my friends, and a dollar short. I mean, this is literally like too, too little too late. Moses said, all right, my brothers, why do you transgress the word of the Lord? The word of the Lord. It will not succeed. Like, wh why are you saying now you want to go to the land? God literally just told me that to tell you you're not going into the land. You're going to die out in the desert and don't even try. So now, on top of not wanting to go in yesterday, now you want to go in when God says don't. Again, you're going against God. Like, you guys are really not getting this right. <laughs> Whatever God says, you want to do the opposite. But again, such is human nature. Literally, such as human nature. Somebody tells you yes, no. Somebody tells you no, yes. There's a bit of immaturity there, right? It's like kind of you got to go against. All right. I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's like, you know, uh, they weren't ready. Moses says to them, do not go up to Israel, for the Lord is not among you, so that you will not be beaten by enemies. Don't go up so that you will not be beaten up by your enemies. If you do go up, you will be beaten by your enemies. Oh, because by the way, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. That's what God said to Moses, FYI. So he's now telling it to the people. Don't even try it. It is a terrible idea. God will not be with you. Amalek, the Canaanites are there. And you will fall by the sword. This will not end well. For you have turned away from the Lord and the Lord will not be with you. Well, some did not listen again, and they defiantly ascended to the mountaintop. But the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses did not move from the camp. They went on their own. Some went on their own. Without the Ark, the Ark would always go ahead of them in battle. And without Moses, who would also lead them in battle in general, they went on their own. And what happened? Tragically, verse 45, the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived on the mountain, this is southern Israel, there was a mountain, this is where they attacked the Jews' tribe. They came down and smote them and crushed them, pursuing them until Kharma, which means they drove them back into the desert. And that ends, that ends um, this narrative. These people are known as the Ma'apilim, the defiant ones. If you look at the Hebrew word here, it's Vayapilu, which means they defiantly lalot, descend, uh, ascended. Yapilu means they acted in defiance. In, in Hebrew, these colloquially, they're known as the Ma'apilim, the defiant ones, the stubborn ones, the ones who said, no, we're going to go fight and conquer Israel even without God. Didn't end well. Do you know the story about Ezekiel and the Valley of the Dry Bones? Are you familiar with that story? How the prophet Ezekiel is showed, is taken to a valley where there are all these um, corpses, just dried out remains, skeletons. And God asks Ezekiel, do you think I can bring these back to life? And Ezekiel answers very wisely. God, you could do whatever you, I'm not going to. You can do it. I believe that you can do whatever you want. So am I going to predict yay or nay? I'm not predicting, but I know you can do whatever you want. So God brought the, God said, arise bones and let flesh cover it again and brought the, these bones back to life. And the question is, which, whose remains were they? Who, who were these people that were brought back to life? In the story in Ezekiel, it's a very famous prophecy and story it's read i think it's read on passover in the haftorah one of the days of passover the story of the valley of dry bones which is the message is you know what was the message like that's a weird like why, why do that and the message is that even when something looks you know down and out it can come back to life you can use it as a metaphor for the jewish people throughout history the land of Israel in modern times, 
you know, whatever. You could use it in when something seems like it's, you know, finished, devastated to come back to life, that type of thing. And of course, the literal meaning is, is an example of or the resurrection of the dead. Anyway, what's the point? The point is that some say that these bones belong to these people, the Mapilim, the guys who try to conquer Israel after they were told not to. And they were they were destroyed. They were just they were they were killed. Some say that they these were the ones that God brought back to life later on, hundreds centuries later, with the prophet Ezekiel. What happened to them afterwards? Did they roam the earth? Some say they continued to live, some say they went back to death. It was just a temporary state of of uh, resurrection whatever the point is i just want to connect it because this is the story of according to some those that were um, resurrected at some point later on in history but they are known as the mapilim those who were defiant but got struck down okay hope that makes sense i'm going to share my screen again let's jump back in okay chapter 15 verse number one the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you arrive in the land, oh, look at this. The first communication after this, look what God says. Tell the people when you arrive in the land, God is trying to lift their spirits. It's going to happen one day. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not for 40 years, but it's going to happen. And I, I want to give you a mitzvah to think about, not as, a, not as a punishment, God forbid. God's not trying to like torture them by saying, when you go into, oh, not you, I'm sorry, I meant your kids. And that's not what God is doing. But it, it's, it's more of stay strong because it's going to happen. So God says, tell the people, when you, when you arrive in the land of your dwelling place, which I'm giving you, I, I'm not not giving it to you. I am giving it to you, right? And you make a fire offering to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, namely a peace offering, for an expressed vow or for a voluntary offering or on your festivals to provide a pleasing fragrance for the Lord from the cattle, from the sheep. This is hearkening back to our Leviticus um, fond memories of all the different types of offerings and different reasons why one would bring it. This is all a case. All these are examples of personal offerings, right? I want to give God a burnt offering. I want to give God a peace offering. It's either a vow or voluntary offering for the festivals or for, or for the festivals. It's, a, it's an offering that person's bringing. So the, the law is the one who brings his offering to the Lord shall present a meal offering as well, containing one-tenth fine flour mixed with a quarter of a hint of oil. So in addition to the animal, there's also the meal offering, i.e. flour and oil. And a quarter of a hint of wine for libation. Don't forget about your wine. For the pouring, the libation, you shall prepare with the burnt offering or for the sacrifice for each lamb. So along with the animal, there's also the meal offering and the wine pouring. Or for a ram, you shall present the meal offering containing two tenths of fine flour, two tenths of fine flour mixed with a third of a hin of oil. So it's a little bit bigger. Instead of one tenth fine flour, it's now two tenths. It's a fifth instead of a tenth. And a third of a hin as opposed to a quarter of a hen. Basically, your quantities, your ingredients bump up when you use a ram instead of a lamb. Rams are bigger than lambs, right? So you go bigger animal, more, it's gotta, gotta stay proportionate, right? So you gotta do more flour and more oil. And the wine also is a bit bigger. Instead of a quarter of a hen, it's a third of a hen. Hen was a measurement, I don't know exactly the, fluid ounces, but it's uh, a third instead of, a, instead of a quarter, which is more. A uh, third of a hint for wine for, of wine for libation, you shall offer up a pleasing fragrance to the Lord. Okay, so that is, that is the fourth reading. Now, tomorrow we are not meeting for DPP. So, um, so, 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 give me one second. Okay, um, let me do this one more time. Tomorrow, we're not meeting because we have the JLI class. Oh, we have a really good class tomorrow. This can happen, lesson five. Um, and then we're back on Friday. So let's see if we can sneak another reading in. How does that sound? Let's see if we can get another 
another reading. It looks like, yeah, let's do it. This is Ari, can I, can yeah, I? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's something I've got here because as as you were going through this uh, this portion, this, this, uh, I was saying to myself, why is it even there? And I have a note here on the Rashi. This is from it says Bear uh, Basada. What's that? It's a commentary on Rashi. He says, uh, he says, we would have expected this passage, which deals with drink offerings and meal offerings, to have appeared in the, in the context of other passages which deal with offerings. It appears here after the episode of the spies, because it begins, when you will come to the land. It thus served to reassure the children of Israel that despite all that had passed, they would ultimately enter the land. Exactly, Yes. It was, it was, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It was a source of comfort and reassurance. I just told you you're not going to go in, but it's going to happen. Your children will go in. This will happen. Stay the course. And here's some mitzvahs to think about when, when that happens. Good, good. All right. It actually continues this, these laws of the sacrifices, which, yeah, kind of a, seem like they're a little bit out of place, but we understand out of the context. Um, and the, the narrative continues. Number chapter 15, verse number eight. This is reading number five. So this is tomorrow's reading, but we're getting a jump. If you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or sacrifice by expressing a vow or for a peace offering for the Lord, with a young bull, he shall offer up a meal offering consisting of a young bull now, instead of a, we did lamb, ram, and now bull. So with a young bull, you should offer up three-tenths fine flour mixed with half a hint of oil. So it's even more oil and more fine flour. And she'll offer up half a hint of wine for libation, a fire offering, a pleasing fragrance to the Lord. So uh, the way I see it is that the larger the animal, the more the accessories are. So, you know, a little lamb, right? What is it? What's the song? Mary had a little lamb. It's a little lamb. You have a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, a little bit of wine. A larger ram, a little bit more flour, more oil, more wine. A big, a larger bull, even a young bull is a big bull, right? More wine, sorry, more flour, more oil, and more wine. So shall it be done for each ox or ram or for a young sheep or young goat in accordance with the number you offer up so shall you present for each one according to their numbers. In other words, each animal that you offer should have the appropriate other offerings, the meal offering and the wine libation. Every native born shall do it in this manner to offer up a fire offering of pleasing fragrance to the Lord. If a proselyte resides with you or those among you in future generations and he offers up a fire offering of pleasing fragrance to the Lord as you make it, so shall he make it. In other words, same deal, same dealio. No two sets of laws, same set of laws. It's done the same way, no matter who brings the offering. Oh, yeah, literally. One rule applies to the assembly, for yourselves and for the proselyte who resides with you. One rule applies throughout your generations, just as it is for you, so, so it is for the proselyte before the Lord. There shall be, once again, one law and one ordinance, for you and the proselyte who resides with you. The Torah is very, very clear on this. There's one set of laws for those that are born into it and those that are not born into it. Um, proselyte is a convert. Is that what proselyte means? Or it means someone yeah. who is, didn't officially convert but wants to just kind of you know, be part of it and hang. I, I, it might even extend to someone who just wants to bring an offering. There's still one set of laws. I, it doesn't really matter. I, I think it even extends to anybody. Like it, it, it you, and you don't have to be Jewish to bring an offering in the temple. Whoever brings it has the same set of laws. And, but I think it overall touches on a bigger issue, which I mentioned a few days ago, I think, and we had in the Judaism's Gifts of the World course, which is a really great course. Um, the idea that justice, there's one set of laws in Judaism, no matter who you are. It's not this hierarchical system of like, oh, well, the priests, oh, they can get away with crimes. It's like, even, you know, it's crazy. And, and you, you and I know this, and no one says anything. There are different laws for diplomats. You know, you have these crazy stories where like the kids of diplomats like are driving and they, they're and then they just fly back to their, and there's, and there's no repercussions. Why? Oh, because they're diplomats. 
and no one and no and no one cares. No one bats an eye. Oh yeah, diplomats, of course. Yeah, you can get away with that. It's like what? Since what, what, how is that a valid thing for? Again, I'm sorry for stepping on a weird soapbox here to like you know take take umbrage or whatever the word is against. I I know it's like out of nowhere. I'm just saying in Judaism, there's a very strong sense of justice is justice. And if you have two sets of justice, then you have no justice. Then it's not just. If there's two different sets of, 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 of law, then it's not justice. It's favoritism. It's not justice. Justice is defined by a blindness, so to speak, of the law. You know that phrase, justice is blind, which could be construed in a negative way. There's a positive meaning for it as well, which is, as the Torah says in many places, including right here, by the way, but the Torah says specifically, um, don't favor the rich, nor don't favor, nor favor the poor. In other words, whether you want to, you know, uh, promote the one that has the connections, or you want to prop up the underdog just because they're the underdog, in both cases, it's wrong. You should judge a case based on its merits, not based on some sort of emotional, you know, pull or other ulterior, ulterior motive this way or this way. Somebody could go to the side of power and money. Some could go to the side of the powerless and, and the, the more um, uh, vulnerable. Either way, it's a perversion of justice, says the Torah. So hold on, what does that mean? That we shouldn't be compassionate? We should be compassionate. But when it comes to law, law is the law. The great example that I've shared many times is the example of, um, of uh, LaGuardia, Mayor LaGuardia, who was also a judge. And one night, the, the, judges weren't, the judge wasn't there. It was a winter, winter night, so he took over the court, the night court. And a woman, a, a, a bubby, a grandmother was brought in. And she had, and, and LaGuardia was Jewish. Italian father, Jewish mother. So, and she's accused of stealing a loaf of bread. Did you do it? Yes. Why'd you do it? Because I want, I need to feed my, feed my grandkids who are starving. So he said, okay, here's your fine. And then he said to everyone in the court, and now you give me a fine, which I'm going to give to her to pay the fine and more for living in a city where poverty is a thing and everyone's going to, going to chip in. But there, the law is the law, and then you have the, the additional support system for those that need. But once you start messing with the law, then you don't really have anything. You don't really have a system. All this to say that when it comes to the sacrifices, it's the same deal. Whether you're a, a, a born Jew, a Jew from birth, or whether you're a new to the tribe Jew, or even, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, even if, and it's not a limb, but extend this a little bit, even someone who's not a member of the tribe, but wants to be involved in this, in the, in the, bring, a, bring an offering, which they were, which everyone was allowed to. There's one set of laws. Because this is the way it's done. And if it's done this way, everyone does it this way. There's no picking and choosing. That sets up all sorts of negativity. All right, so what are our lessons for today? Number one, be careful what you wish for. You might just get it, right? The people didn't want to go in uh, to the land of Israel. All right, that's what you got. Number two, you have to be careful when it comes to human nature, which is to be contrarians, right? You tell me this, no. You tell me, you tell me yes, I'll say no. You tell me no, I'll say yes. To be careful to try to notice that and do away with that. We don't have to be Dafkinics, like just, oh, because you said it, I'm going to go. We don't need to do that whole thing. We just, what if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. We don't need to, you know, get, get all worked up about, you know, what the other person said or whatever. Um, and what is the final uh, message here? I, I want to take a message from the, from the increase in the libation and, and the meal offering. The higher the stakes, no pun intended, we ended off with uh, with beef. The higher the stakes, the more we have to, the more other stuff we have to put in. So as we grow, right, we have to we have to grow, right. As we learn more and mature more, everything has to continue to grow around us. So if we've been studying a certain amount of Torah, as we're growing, we need to add to that a mitzvah, a certain mitzvah, a mitzvah in a certain way. We should always look for the growth to augment and support and be consistent with our growth as 
human beings. So let's always remember to lift everything up as we continue our upward and onward journey. All right, thank you for joining me today for DPP. It's great to, uh, to DPP with you to, uh, to study the Torah portion. And we are on, we're not on tomorrow for DPP because we have the JLI in person. We're back Friday, but breaking news. Friday, I just got word that there is an appointment. Oh, you know what? Maybe it's not an issue. I may be able to work around it. Okay, stay tuned for Friday. Um, worst case scenario, I may need to move the time a drop. Okay, so stay tuned. If I need to move it, I'll let you know in advance. It'll be on Zoom either way, but maybe I won't be. Able, I, maybe I won't need to move it. So just hang tight with that. I'm going to figure it out. Okay, it's just an appointment that came up for one of the kids, and I'm going to try to figure this out. All right, it's good tomorrow. To uh, yeah. I cannot come in person. I have to go to the office. So got it. Need to let you know. We will miss you, and we'll leave your space. Mm -hmm you know, ready, just in case. Um, <laughs> yeah, just in case. <laughs> so um, if you want to catch the class, were you on Tuesday? No, you weren't on Yeah, Tuesday. last night. Oh, you were on, was, oh, you were on last night. Okay, I was I, late, the days are so but, uh, running into each other in my head. I okay, got it. I will the beginning on, uh, on YouTube. Perfect. No, yeah. on, on the link that you sent, yeah. It's already, I think it should already be up. I, I haven't checked, but it, hopefully the recording is already posted. Um, okay, good. Great to see you all. And... We'll see you soon. Tonight, Torah studies. Tonight. Yes. Exciting. All right. Bye bye. Yes. Is three still good for you? Yes, it's perfect. You, you don't pick up kids from school? No, no, no. It's good. It's good. Okay. I got, yeah, it's it's perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.